Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to another AgVisor Pro webinar. My name is Rob Syke, and I'm your host. And AgVisor Pro is an ecosystem that connects questions to experts, either independent or company experts, to answer um, those questions, provide answers now. Today, we're going to delve into the topic of sustainability and carbon. We're going to record this session, make it available also as a webinar and also as a podcast that can be accessed while you're driving. And so, oh, we got a little bit of background noise, guys, here. So whoever has got some background noise, if you can just mute. Thank you. So we've got four guests for you today, and they're different in terms of how they approach sustainability, how they look at carbon. Harry Green. Harry Green is the uh, co-founder, CRO of Propagate, and he's got the right kind of name for the uh, company that he's running. And Harry deals in the area of agroforestry and long-term carbon sequestration. They got a really interesting model. And so Harry is kind of an outlier in terms of uh, what we've been working on because uh, agriculture, of course, is, mono uh, is uh, annual for the most part, and Harry's thinking long-term. Then we have Neil Smith. Now, Neil Smith is working with a company called Carbon Asset Solutions. All of their descriptions are in the invitation that you all had to um, join um, or sign up when you came into the webinar. Uh, Carbon Asset Solutions is actually a measurement-based model, and we're going to learn more about what distinguishes uh, Neil. Now, Mike Ferguson is with a, a newer venture called Collective Carbon Impact. Uh, they're acting as a liaison, a coordinator between some of the companies out there and what can and cannot be done in agriculture. Uh, Michael was uh, an ex-agri-trend uh, uh, market coach. And so our histories go back a long time to when I was running Agritrend. And then Derek Squire uh, has just joined Trimble. Derek was the president of Agritrend Marketing and for those of you who don't know, Agritrend back in 2007 founded Agritrend Aggregation that is now Trimble, and they've done something like $55 million worth of carbon offset business in the province of Alberta, and Derek has taken on a new role. So let's begin with, uh, let's see, we'll begin with, uh, uh, we'll begin with Mr. Green. And uh, so, uh, Harry, what does sustainability mean to you what is what does sustainability mean to you how do you look at it looks like harry's having some issues i'm going to toss the ball over to michael ferguson michael what does sustainability mean to you uh from your perspective we'll get into what your company does in a second but what the hell does sustainability mean I think sustainability to myself means that everyone in the supply chain, everyone wins when looking at what's what's for the greater good. You can't have sustainability at one end of the spectrum and not at the other. So it has to be a process. It has to be a vision that everyone shares where everyone is moving forward. Everyone is doing something for the better good for you know, whether it's sustainability of land, or you know, businesses need to be sustainable going forward. So in the end, there has to be a net benefit for the entire industry to go forward um, and, and really really move ahead together, so. Okay, uh, Neil Smith, sustainability, toss to you, buddy. What does uh, sustainability mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I think Mike uh, touched on it. It's a, it's a holistic approach, um, you know, ecology, human and, uh, economics have to come together to uh, to be a win-win solution there. So it's a trifecta of multiple aspects coming together for a, a greater good and a greater outcome. Say that again, those trifectas are what? Uh, ecological, human, yeah. and economics. Okay. Derek, what's your thoughts? Uh, unmute, Derek. Uh, yeah, it, it's... To me, it's sustainability is the ESG component of it. It's environmental, sustainable, and governance. And it, it's it's along the same kind of lines as what Michael and, and Neil had said. You know, I think in agriculture, specifically in agriculture, sustainability is both uh, feeding 9 billion people uh, uh, with with lower nitrogen use and, and doing it with economical and environmental and governance all in mind. Um, so uh, everyone needs to win, as we've said. 
uh, and moving the industry forward. Okay. I'm going to let Harry answer. Are you back with us, Harry? What does sustainability mean to you? Yes. Apologies for that. My uh, internet connection was moving in and out. Sustainability for us boils down to ecology and calories at the same time. So mm -hmm. fat, carbs, protein, and sustainability. And long-term sustainability can mean intact ecosystems, all those ecosystem services that we depend on uh, while feeding us at the same time in the context of agriculture. Okay, so those are all fairly nebulous. This is typical where we start the discussion. Sustainability is fairly nebulous. It is what you want it to be. If you had a conversation with people around a din dinner table, they would all have some, uh, they would all have common ground. Sustainability is around values. The real question is, how the heck do you quantify? How the heck do you know if you are truly sustainable? So uh, we're gonna start off, uh, Derek, you, you got a publicly traded company, Trimble. Um, certainly, you're not going to get involved in any fly-by-night things. How is your company, Trimble, looking at sustainability and carbon? Are they the same thing? And is there an opportunity for farmers, agriculture, to monetize either sustainability or carbon or both? You can speak to that. Yeah. So I, I believe that carbon is part of sustainability. And, and so to answer your question where we are monetizing carbon today, uh, there's, there's a regulated carbon market in Alberta today that is, is transitioned from a tillage, mar uh, uh, tillage protocol to a NERP protocol, which is a nitrous oxide reduction protocol. And so if we're making fertilizer more efficient, uh, we can capture uh, that data and, and monetize it and pay Anywhere, you know, depending on the rate, you know, anyone anywhere from a dollar fifty to four dollars per acre, depending on, you know, the four hours that you're you're doing, um, you know, the the right rate, the right time, the right source, uh, and the um, right product, uh, the right product. Sorry, yeah, and and so so those those are the things that are 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 you know, you capturing carbon or, uh, carbon sequestration today. There's voluntary markets in Canada as well that that are 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 less you know the, the dollars in in uh, in the regulated market are sixty five dollars a ton today, uh, where the regulate or the voluntary market is is more like fourteen to fifteen. So depending on on the program and the protocol, uh, there's there's different rates of returns there. So we are capturing it. I believe that carbon is just a part of the answer though. Like we we are working on Trimble is working on sustainability in water usage. And so we're measuring how many uh, bushels per uh, inch of rain, for example. Um, we're, we're measuring sustainability in um, like nitrogen use efficiency that I'd mentioned, uh, but also in food sustainability in traits of food. So uh, we've had, uh, you know, there's internal within Trimble, but also external companies that are uh, working on uh, drone spraying and and uh, seeing eye spraying, green on green, which is reducing herbicide uh, residue in crops. And so that that's a big passion of, of mine. And and really uh, going forward, we're, we're able to to sell into markets that are are paying for for those kinds of products that have that data and that sustain those sustainability traits are getting into the food chain. And we're using it as scope three uh, reductions. So those are all scope three, which are supply management protocols that are going into the food system. And, and yeah, Trimble right. has a software to do that. Okay. So a um, lot to unpack there. One is you mentioned tillage protocol. It really was a reduction tillage protocol that reduced tillage, allowing farmers to sequester more. Nitrous oxide re uh, emission reduction protocol, uh, nit NERP, nitrous oxide emission reduction protocol. So one is around removal. The other one is about reduction. And then water use efficiency isn't really about either. It's more about how sustainably, how efficiently can you grow the crop. Neil, your company, uh, Carbon Asset Solutions, is actually in the business of, of measuring um, removal. You're actually in the sequestration space. Talk to us a little bit about what Carbon Asset Solutions does. I know you're working in three different countries right now. And a little bit about your view um, when, as a soil scientist, we look at 
uh, soil and, and carbon sequestration, that ability to measure it is, uh, is, is a big debate, is a big debate. And so you guys are trying to crack that code. Talk to us a little bit about, about that. Yeah, great. I uh, appreciate it. Um, I would say a little bit biased that we have cracked that code over our carbon asset solutions. Um, we're using a pretty wonderful technology uh, developed uh, with our partners down in the U.S. Uh, we've taken that commercial. So we're we're not only measuring, we're measuring at scale. So we're, we're able to measure uh, land at, at volume uh, accurately, uh, 95% plus or minus two, which is something to take note of. Um, down to 30 centimeters uh, and provide meaningful data near to real time uh, back to the landowner. Um, Carbon Asset Solutions uh, took it a step further and said, hey, you know, we, we want to uh, be able to have a turnkey solution. So we uh, built our own methodology, built our own registry and are able to help monetize the data, i.e. turn that into carbon credits and help the landowner monetize that. So in a nutshell, um, that's what we do. Uh, we're in three countries, as you mentioned, Australia, Canada, US, and continue to uh, find acres and uh, continue to expand our, our presence. So you're a, you're a measurement-based model. I'm looking at your uh, website right now. It says scan, report, verify, generate, reward, and offset. So a farmer <laughs> started with you by doing an actual measurement and then repeating that measurement over time. Is that correct? Yeah, so we come in, we do a baseline uh, scan, and uh, we'll come back every two years and validate the uh, the net gain. We're, we pay on the net gain of carbon sequestered, so the carbon dioxide that uh, we can put into the ground, um, and we measure, uh, as I said, accurately uh, across the whole field. Um, one of the things that is interesting and, and allows us to stand apart a little bit is we, we initially set up as an offset credit, but we can actually... Uh, help and, and function in any of the uh, in the scopes and we can be a scope three we can do insets so you know as the landowner approaches and say hey we've got an idea absolutely we can help facilitate all of that michael this is a new company you started collective impact uh, carbon i uh, had a conversation with you prior to this webinar uh, neil just mentioned scope three you mentioned that somewhere in the mix of things, you guys are collaborating. Uh, Chris uh, Chris Babbings uh, was with AgVisor Pro for a while. He's now the president there. Tell us a little bit about how and what are you, what the heck are you guys doing and how does that fit in uh, in terms of um, farmers, helping farmers monetize this carbon or sustainability uh, marketplace? Yeah, so Collective Impact Carbon is, like you said, a brand new company where we really fit to play is we're the connection between a lot of boardrooms in big cities that want to focus on carbon and what's actually going on in the ground. So we're meeting with the farmers at the kitchen tables in their fields. Um, and there's there's a big gap there. So, you know, the one line that I always use is we at Collective Impact Carbon, we, we make sense out of it, right? And I mean, sense as in dollars, because a lot of yeah. farmers don't know how to make how to monetize this, you know, what does that mean for their type of operation? Are you a grain guy? Are you a mixed farm? Are you a cattle farmer? How can that, how can carbon play a role into your farm? So we're the connection there. We're helping develop a lot of the uh, voluntary markets. We've talked about scope three here. Well, so what is, what is scope three? Help me understand that. So scope three is where the companies are reporting their greenhouse gas emissions, their carbon footprint, their goals that they want to reduce um, both of those. And so they that is a number that they report on in their ESG reports that they do every year. So that is very attractive for shareholders, for investors. Uh, they have a lot of uh, goals when it comes to, hey, let's be net zero by 2050. Let's you know reduce our greenhouse gas by X amount by 2030. So that's where they're looking at their scope three emissions. So we are helping those companies impact change in, in their supply sheds to say, yeah, we are helping producers reduce or eliminate their greenhouse gases. Because as of right now, when you talk to a farmer, no one goes and says, you know what, I'm gonna learn and focus and do a, a crop plan on carbon. You know, it's a, 
they do a crop plan, they do a fertilizer plan, they have a chemical plan, but no one is really bringing carbon and what that means to their farm. Okay. So that's where we're helping bridge that gap. We'll come back to data in a second here. I'm going to go over to Harry Green now. Harry comes to us from a completely different perspective. Harry, you're really talking about long term and you're talking about agriculture, forestry, you're talking about forestry here and how that can be utilized by farmers. Talk to us a little bit about this very interesting model and, uh, yeah. and how it works. Absolutely. So let's let's first think about windbreaks on farms and then start to think about profitable windbreaks. And we can look at the crop protection that you get there, which can be from one to 4% increase in cropland because of that protection from desiccation. And you can also look at the long-term timber value. So basically what we're focusing on is systems that are inherently profitable and then sequester carbon as a byproduct. So you can look at 20 to 80 tons of CO2 stored visibly on the ground and at the same time, you don't have to change any of your operations. 20 to 80 tons per what? Per acre. Per acre, okay. All right. And, and then what, that can what, be what, 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 what time frame are you looking at here, Harry? That, that's, that's over 30 years. So it's okay. at, at minimum, call it 0.2 to 0.6 tons per acre per year. And then depending on how far the trees are apart and what their, what their species and spacing in row is, then the carbon can increase from there. So when you say 0.2 to 0.6, that's a carbon dioxide equivalent metric tons, right? CO2Es. Correct. CO2E, not C. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, um, I'm going to keep with you and then I'm going to turn back through everybody else. Uh, because of my background in agri-trend aggregation and uh, the experience we had starting in 2007, I know that at the end of the day, we never sold any carbon at all. All we sold was data because it was the data that substantiated the carbon. So talk to me a little bit about data, Harry, and how the heck does that play a role in, in, in a buyer? Let's say the buyer is Nova Chemicals or Microsoft or AWS or somebody is buying something. Yep. What the hell are they buying? Yeah, so they are buying the right to claim that carbon as something that they paid to sequester or offset. And they can do that in a number of different ways. They can pay for reduced emissions or they can pay for carbon actually taken out of the atmosphere. And they have a number of different reasons for doing that, but we can save that for a different conversation. I think it's really important to dive into the supply and demand of carbon and within that, the quality of carbon. So people are bearish and bullish on different forms of carbon sequestration. And the MR, so in terms of measuring, measuring what you reference, the MRV space right now that's measuring, reporting, and verification is very crowded. So folks are jazzed about measuring the carbon and reporting it, and we need more projects that sequester a good amount of carbon profitably. How that's paid for is another question, and I'm happy to dive into that. Okay, we'll get in that in a second. Uh, Neil, uh, he just said something. Measure, uh, report, verify, MRV. Seems to me that that is, like on your website, scan, verify, and generate report revenue. Um, who says you're right? Yeah, good question. Um, a fully digital MRV platform has gone through the rigor uh, from ISO, uh, people reviewing the data um, to soil scientists. The technology has been around much longer than we have been commercialized. So we've been commercialized for a couple of years now. Um, and there's third-party research uh, papers uh, as well as uh, many other subject matter experts and, and soil scientists uh, and engineers that have all vetted the data accuracy and the rigor. Um, so we're very confident when we say, you know, 95% accuracy plus or minus two, and it's meaningful data. Uh, and I agree with Harry, you know, the, the MRV space is crowded. Uh, and I think Carbon Asset Solutions is coming in to say, hey, you know, a fully digital uh, MRV platform 
that has something that you can substantiate that is qualified um, and meaningful is going to uh, stand apart from uh, some of the other options that are out there. Yeah, I don't think there's any shortage of of uh, of market. I don't think there's any shortage of boardrooms. And I see in the uh, in the people that are on the uh, on the, on the guest list here. If you, if you, anybody on the guest list would like to ask a question or whatever, feel feel free to do so. Uh, we we certainly will address those questions as they as they pop in. So I'm going to get back to the data here. And uh, at the end of the day. Um, you just said that the data um, is verified or uh, you, you guys verified the data and it's been kind of proven and vetted. Um, who would be an example of who, who believes your data and will pay for it, Neil? Like, give me an example of somebody, if you can, give me an example of somebody who would believe that and would rest their boardroom decisions on that. Yeah, so we... I won't mention any names, but we do have uh, purchasers from different industries, uh, as well as within the uh, food and um, food and agriculture industry that uh, are multinationals that are very interested in the data itself, not only for uh, the purchasing of the sequestered carbon. Um, something else I, I didn't mention, but we do staple on ESG data and GHG, so we net that out against the actual sequestered carbon. At the end of the day, that's what the landowner is getting paid on. Um, so we're adding value to those carbon credits that we're creating. Uh, and that is that has taken the uh, um, caught the the ear of uh, many different boardrooms uh, in different market spaces, energy, egg, food, uh, and some other ones on a global basis. Um, so okay, that's so that I, I, some I, information I can there. see what you're doing. Uh, you're actually going in the field, three different continents, you're measuring three different countries, you're measuring this stuff and you're coming back and measuring it again. You're establishing these baselines and the subsequent uh, increase in carbon in the soil as you're measured over time. I get it. That That's uh, that's interesting. That's removal. If a farmer can do that, then there's value there. We'll come to permanence in a second here. Uh, Michael, if, if, if you're talking like... It's pretty nebulous what you were saying, actually. You're saying we go to the farm field and we talk to the farmer and we talk to these companies. And like, I'm trying to figure out, show me the money, buddy. Like, uh, where well, does it, how does it come from? So I, I think one thing, anyone who's worked in the data space is if you put junk in, you get junk out. Our job is to be that first filter to, to work with the farmer to make sure that that information, that data that they're collecting is actually accurate stories being told on the practices that they're doing and there's there's the data and the proof is behind the pudding because we've had lots of times before where the farmer says yeah i'm doing this and it's like well show me that you're doing it before i pay you the money you know they want the money there has to be data that's collected there has to be a, a systematic approach that says here if you're going to give me this data this is how much money you're going to get there's a big range of how much you could collect you know, is it a, a checkoff box that people say and you get a buck an acre or is it a full detailed report where you get five dollars an acre so there's for each company each mrv each program there's different criteria out there um, okay. that each farmer has to meet so our job is to really educate the producers and also educate the the boardrooms because a lot of them say yeah we want the top end credit information but we don't we don't want to pay it for it, and it's for for data collection for the effort on the farmer. It has to make sense for both parties. So we're the that group that bridges the gap. Okay, so I'm I'm starting to understand this a little bit. So you come out to the farm, you have an interview with the farmer. Farmer says, "Yeah, she's interested in something to do with carbon or maybe offsets." And we'll get into insets here in a second uh, or sustainability tracking. But at the end of it all. It has to come through in some sort of a data a flow. Derek, you you know, again, our history goes back. Agri-data or the Agri-data solution from Agritrend is now Trimble Ag Software. Trimble plays a fairly agnostic role in, in agricultural data. And uh, just touch a little bit on data as it pertains to carbon and data as it would pertain to sustainability. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, so data as it, as it is to carbon is is we need to follow protocols in order to, for them to be a registered um, uh, offset. So in that in that case, it's it's data come from. Well, just to stop like the protocol. Who who the hell designs the protocols? I understand they can come from government or they can come from companies. That's right. So that's the difference in my mind between an offset and an inset. So an offset is is an Alberta protocol in this case, or, or a government protocol usually um, that is backed by a registered registry, uh, the CSA in this case in Canada. Okay. Uh, and and that and so we talked about data collection and and it's all about agronomy. It's about a crop plan and a soil test. So those are the protocols that are out there today in a registered market. It, in a voluntary market, those are you know that's what that you know the other data that's being collected. It can be um, spatial data. It can be um, uh, you know the the benchmarks and 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 making it you know higher carbon in in the soil for a voluntary market. The way um, you know the sustainability piece that you talked about is and here's an example is the scope three of this is where you know where Trimble's going where I think the agriculture industry is going is. You know, we, we're, we're, we're figuring out how to, to measure all that, but eventually the sustainability portion is going to be the traits that go with it. And I think that's part of your question there is, you know, the water sustainability. And here's a great example is, is a scope three, for a, which is a supply uh, carbon credit um, uh, of canola, for example, that is crushed. And then the oil goes into the biodiesel market. That is a scope three supply management for any any fuel company, you know, Shell, Chevron, name, you know, to name a couple. So those companies are looking to buy Canadian oil uh, for their for their biodiesel. And there's a scope three emission there. So there's carbon credits that go with that, but there's also this the sustainable data that goes with that as well. That this this canola was grown sustainably. It had lower nice nitrogen use, nitrogen use. It had lower uh, you know, for example, there's three inches of water that grew a 60 bushel canola crop. So that that bushels per inch of rain is very important to to the sustainability metrics of, of a lot of final emitters. So I think that's where, you know, we're, we're talking about carbon as one piece of sustainability. You know, if you if you think about that. And so uh, there's this, there's a, a thing called environmental impact quotient. And so if you're growing um if you're growing uh, 300 bushels of corn and you're using a herbicide, that herbicide is being spread over 300 bushels of corn. If you use the same herbicide on the same acre and you go 200 bushels of corn, the environmental impact quotient is higher. I know that on the uh, guest list right now, we got uh, Terry Eberhardt and Warren Bills. Those guys are concentrating on something called pristine ingredients, which basically is a plan to try to demonstrate a reduction in the active ingredients per acre that's grown and ultimately delivered to a, a grocery store. And if you could quantify that, is there is there an option here? Shifting over to you, Harry, again, because you're uh, quite an anomaly here in in uh, in, in how um, farmers interact with you. Talk to me about your data system with an agroforestry long term, twenty to thirty year horizon, and why would a so first of all why would a farmer do this? Because maybe like 20, 30 years, who's your customer there? And secondly, what's the data play with you guys, Harry? Yeah, so I'll, I'll walk you through how we work. So we have, a, we have software, it's called Overyield. And what Overyield does is catalog the expected costs, revenues, yields, labor assumptions, and then economic returns, financial returns over 30 years. You look at your farm, you draw lines on it, rows of trees, change the species, change the spacing. And whenever you change any of those parameters, the financials automatically update. It also works with annual crops. We mostly focus on trees. Whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean it works for annual crops? Yeah. So you can, you can load annual crops into the software. That's not our focus. Right. So the yeah. way we work is a project develop. So secondly, we're a project developer and people hire us to plant trees on farms. Those are usually long-term uh, economic assets. So we, we think of those as assets separate from the land itself. And then what we do is actually finance those trees. So we raise a round of capital and equity finance trees on leased land. 
Okay, so Farmer Rob has uh, Harry come out to his field and say, I think that there's some opportunity based on geography and topography to plant some trees here. And then we would talk about the types of trees that I potentially could plant. We'll do a model and then explain to me the financial side. You said you'd finance this. Yeah, so you got that right. How that works is we either work through a long-term, so it's a long-term lease with Farmer Rob. And Farmer Rob can either get annual lease payments for the ground that those trees are on, or he can have a revenue share in the benefit of the trees. So when either when those trees are harvested or in honestly, we're working on 2,400 acres in Kentucky where we have chestnuts, yeah. um, he can have a cut essentially of that crop. And the returns on that, the internal rate of return is in the low to high teens, depending on market channels. So the, these, uh, these systems are generally not always, you have to do it well, but or as with anything, uh, you're, you're looking at returns for permanent crops that are generally quite good. It's interesting. I was just in Indianapolis, uh, Indi Indiana, not long ago, visiting my buddy, D Damian Mason. Damian Mason, he has a um, Business of Agriculture podcast. And Damian was showing me, well, these here are hickory and these here are chestnut and these here are oak and these are all maple. And all of them had different values associated with those trees. Uh, do you operate in Canada or just in the United States? Where are you at with that, Harry? So we're, we overyield the software is geography agnostic. So okay. we have operations in the US. Uh, folks use our crop templates in Canada. Uh, we're working in Mediterranean Europe and Hawaii and then the Dominican Republic. So whoever wants to sign in and use the software to do tree crop financial planning, that's, that's fair game. In terms of financing, we're focused first on our own backyard in New York and in Kentucky. Okay. All right. So uh, just so I understand, I think there's two revenue streams here. One is the uh, calculation of the offsets of the 0.2 to 0.6 CO2 ease per year. And the other one is actually the long-term benefit of actually growing that crop and harvesting it eventually, which is very valuable, right? Correct. And it's, it's more the second one. So we focus on the intrinsic non-carbon, non-ecosystem value of the tree. And then the ecosystem value of it is, is the icing on the cake, depending on what that buyer of credits or, or ecosystem services is looking to accomplish. Interesting. Okay. So to me, that would be something that I would look at if I had topography, geography that wasn't really lending itself nicely to cropping, and I could turn that into agroforestry. I like that idea. I like that. Correct. Neil, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the whole idea here of measuring carbon in soils. If you put uh, seven soil scientists in a room and ask them to define uh, organic matter you would have seven different uh, uh, seven different arguments, and there'd be a fight breaking out because somebody is uh, you know measuring Wakely Black versus some other types of systems. Can you talk to me a little bit about um, what your perspective is? Because you're working in three different countries, I got to think that the accumulation of organic matter in Western Australia is lower than the accumulation of organic matter up at Melfort, Saskatchewan. So talk to me a little bit about your outlook in terms of a farmer actually being able to increase carbon in the soil, measure it, and what factors do you think play a role in increasing that faster? Yeah, some, some really good questions. So I'm going to unpack and say I, I don't have a lot of... Um, of the data from Australia. Um, okay. We've only just started going there. So I'm gonna to speak to the North American where we've been sure. active for a bit. Um, and, and as you mentioned, yeah, there's a, there's a wide spectrum of different soil types and uh, soil scientists, agronomists are gonna have different opinions about, you know, what the organic matter that's there. Our machine is measuring total carbon. Um, and really what we lean into and, and not to overuse a term is, and we qualify this with some of our subject matter experts in the field. Um, and we're very specific to not provide recommendations, but suggestions and, and link in the, the specialist on these practice changes, but it leans towards the regenerative model. So the keeping the soils covered, the cover crops that go down, um, livestock. We actually engage a lot. There's a question around pastures. We engage a lot with ranchers, livestock, native land. 
Um, we feel it's, it, you know, there's a lot of great potential there. You also mentioned well military top. bases too, and we talked before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 We've done a, a few projects um, uh, around working with uh, military bases um, in the U.S. And uh, so I, I often say we're land agnostic. Um, we're a clean tech company. And, and what we do very well is measure the uh, total organic in the soil. Um, and for those wanting to make practice changes, uh, you know, we have a great, great network of people that can help out. But we have seen and heard um, and can qualify that the regenerative uh, methodology is probably being something uh, of an easy step, easy to qualify, um, and usually the right direction to go in terms of sequestering carbon. Well, so that's uh, time for a commercial. So um, Agvisor Pro is the is the company that we built. It's an ecosystem for agriculture. You download it iOS or Android, and you can reach all these experts on Agvisor Pro. That's what we built it for. It's an algorithm that basically matches a question to experts, either independent or business, that you would never know. And so our objective in building AgVisor Pro is to welcome all of agriculture, whether you're livestock, whether you've got equipment problems, irrigation issues, viticulture, aquaculture, whether you've got insurance or HR issues, uh, marketing questions. AgVisor Pro is a collective ecosystem for all of agriculture. It's esoteric as heck, but when you download it and start to use it, you go, oh my God, this is amazing. There's companies there and there's a lot of communities you can join, such as the regenerative ag community. So when, Michael, when we start talking with Neil about moving down the path of trying to increase carbon sequestration and measure it in soils, where does that handoff between this is what I want to do and these are the experts that I need to work with and how does that fit with you? Because ultimately um, nothing happens unless we start increasing those carbon numbers or decreasing our input uh, per bushel per ton. Yeah, so I'm very fortunate. My mother was a school teacher and, you know, she preached the value of education. I think that's where we the, we as farmers need to continue to be educated on carbon, on what those management practices are. And so that's one of the roles we take, uh, you know, very serious is it starts off with education because otherwise you're not going to have a true understanding of what changes you do need to make on your farm. And so we educate at the top end level, we educate at the bottom end level. So we start with that. And then we start working with industry as well. We're educating agronomists, we're educating chemical reps, we're educating grain buyers, we're educating, um, you know, equipment dealers even. You know, what does this mean for them? Because if you're going at this solely, strictly by a farm, you're, you're going down the regenerative pathway, let's say, like Neil said, who do you turn to for that education, right? And maybe, you know, Eggvisor Pro, you're probably seeing that success with your regen group, but that community, we're part of that community that can help link um, to people on the ground that can help you. So right now we're working with about 130 farmers in Western Canada here, and it's peer groups, it's peer learning, it's peer educational too. And it's sponsored by companies that are in the States that are across in Europe saying, we wanna make change on the ground. So they're going through Collective Impact Carbon we're working with the farmers, help it create that change. I'll have to bring you into my power farm group, see what you can do for us. Now, G Graham Gilchrist in the question and answers said something. The gold standard to protect the materiality of the data and the claim is when the project, the verifier, and the register, register, uh, registry are all third party from each other. Now, Derek, this is interesting because... Um, as I'm seeing this, and I, I'm not on putting words in your mouth, but as I see this thing morph out with Trimble, again, I bring up the, the uh, issue that Trimble is a, uh, is a publicly traded company. Um, Trimble doesn't sell fertilizer. They don't sell seed. They don't buy grain. They don't sell fuel. Uh, they're really a technology driver. Um, can Trimble? serve as that third party registry instead of having to de depend on individual provincial or state registries. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that's the when we we get into the conversation of insets and, and versus offsets. So, you're, you're talking insets, in insets, right? Insets, yeah, yeah, yeah. insets. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Those are in insets are are food companies, and in, in the example that we use is 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 they're they're off they're insetting their internal carbon footprint by by using and I've talked about it a couple of times the supply chain and and so there's major food companies that need to have certain uh, reduction by 2025 2028 or 2030 depending on when they've made their commitments to the to the market uh, that they they are going to be sustainably uh, you know reducing sustainability and carbon by 20 percent or by more you know 50% of their products more sustainably, those types of, of promises to the marketplace, they're falling through with that now. And it's really, uh, really getting a lot of traction in the industry right now. And, and Trimble is facilitating a lot of that between between producers and and the you know the challenges that we're you know, we're talking about here with the challenges of the the packaged goods companies that are are trying to connect with farmers. So Trimble is doing that connection today. And and having a, an exchange or a, dat, a data warehouse that um, a company, a uh, packaged good company, can say, I want to buy 100,000 tons of carbon grown or uh, carbon friendly barley and climate uh, smart solutions, right? So those are those those climate smart commodities are are is a new trend in the industry today that they can actually. Uh, buy lots of corn or bought lots of wheat and and put it into their supply chain and reduce their carbon footprint. That's interesting. Climate smart commodities. So there's two sides to the. I'm going to stick on the carbon side now for a second. There's two sides to the carbon equation. One is removal, and the other one is reduction. Now reduction, I can show very quickly. I can tell you whether I have uh, used sectional shutoff on my farm to prevent double and triple overlaps. I can show you that I'm a variable rate farmer putting on less or more nitrogen and phosphorus potash where needed and not needed. I can also tell you that I have bought and utilized nitrification or urease or nitrogen inhibitors. I can demonstrate that and I can demonstrate it every year. And that is a reduction. It's a reduction from what would have happened in the past. Uh, removal is uh, an entirely different thing. You're you're getting paid to remove carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And Neil, how do you deal with the issue of permanence here? Uh, and and I'll come to to Harry next. But when you when when I get paid by somebody, call it Microsoft, for my offsets uh, because I've sequestered, and I sell my land to Peter, my neighbor, is he obligated to maintain the practices that I have? In other words, is there a contingent liability? And let's talk about permanence here. Yeah, you great question, great question. Um, really short, one of the things Carbon Asset Solutions done really well is recognize the gaps and holes in, in the whole carbon program modeling. So hence why we built our own registry, we, we've done, um, everything internally uh, from start to finish. As it relates to our program, it's a very easy program for any landowner to be involved in. Um, and it uh, really uh, allows for uh, a lot of peace of mind all the way through. Um, one of the things we have done is answered the question on permanence. So what we do is we uh, will pay the farmer a percentage of our carbon credit sale, same percentage all the time. And there's a portion of that carbon credit that gets held in a buffer. That buffer then gets translated into purchasing land and putting trees down. And so we're answering that question of permanence internally and not, not uh, putting any pressure onto the landowner to try to answer that for whatever reason, if they want to exit out of our program. Um, so All that right. is, so, so that is a what farmer we've done. Can, a farmer can deal with carbon asset solutions, get measurements, one four, six, eight years in the future, uh, capitalize, monetize those measurements. And then if I make a change, there's not a lawsuit coming my way. Correct. I mean, the thing I always say is when you get involved with the carbon program, it's, it's two businesses wanting to work together for the, the greater outcome, sustainability, what we've qualified early on in the conversation. Um, you know, if you know, if we know you're, selling the land to a developer, of course, we're going to have different questions there. You know, there might be something 
uh, that comes along, but our, our putting the pressure or putting the responsibility of permanence onto the farmer, we've removed that. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of exit clauses out of our um, program, should you choose to, without penalization. Um, we don't want to penalize the landowner for trying to do good. Uh, we just want to be a mechanism to ensure that we provide measurement that they can monetize um, as opposed to modeling. So we measure the measurement that they can monetize a program that is fairly turnkey, an immutable blockchain, third-party reviewer of our projects. So we remove the human manipulation uh, of data. We're answering a lot of those questions um, and, and start to create rigor within the voluntary market, which is where we're playing right now and they're regulated uh, soon enough. Okay, let's go to you, Harry. Let's talk uh, about uh, let's talk about contingent liability and permanence and um, you know. Um, the horizon, everybody talks about 2030, 2050. Uh, you're a pretty young guy, but if you're planting trees today, I mean, you're, you're going to probably have hair my color by the time you really quantify uh, the whole business. And so talk to me a little bit about, um, you know, propagate and how you guys look at permanence and contingent liability and payment. Absolutely. So the great thing about trees is that they're, they're visible. They're really easy to measure. MRV is not a challenge for us. You can walk up to a tree and measure its diameter. You can also fly by it with a drone, or you can see it from space, whether that's satellite image or with LIDAR. That's so yeah. understanding the permanence of whether a tree is or isn't there and how big it is, is very accessible to buyers of carbon, registries, anyone in the MRV space. So if, if buyers of carbon or of ecosystem services want to be sure that the tree's there, that, that's no challenge. The other thing to look at there is the non-carbon benefits that that tree is hopefully providing will ensure its permanence. So if, if the farmer uh, or new landowner is, is accruing benefit from that tree that's intentionally planted for a specific reason, then uh, all the more is the likelihood that they'll keep it around. All right. So... Um... Michael, uh, you're staring at a company, you're, you're building a company, and this is maybe Warren Bill's lobbed this ball, so just get ready for this one, Michael. So um, he says that uh, it seems like the whole world is pushing towards uh, reduction of carbon. Uh, is there going to be a market? Is the market eventually going to diminish? Now, I haven't ha heard this before, but because I think the market is so uh, so neat, so hot right now. Let's say that valid question down the line as uh, as uh, we stare into the future and you're talking to companies and they start meeting some of these obligations. Is the opportunity for agriculture going to diminish? And is it like many other parts of business going to benefit the early adopters or is it a market that will be there for the early majority or even the laggards? Yeah. So the one thing that we focus on is a short term and in agriculture spe specifically, you see the crop once a year, you harvest the crop once a year, right? And so it's a short term um, opportunity there. And I think that creates its unique challenging challenges because in other industries like mining, for example, they explore for 15 years, build for 10, and it's 25 years out before they actually produce the copper, before they produce gold. You know, same thing with forestry. How long does it take for a tree from the minute it's planted? You know, that you're looking at 30 plus years. Agriculture has a unique opportunity because every year we can capture and measure. Um, our weather changes every year. You know, I wish I knew what the weather was going to do next year, but every year, crops specifically have their own challenges is, you know, is how big is that canola crop going to be this year versus what it was in 2021. So I think it creates, in our perspective, a unique opportunity for agriculture to separate itself from other industries that are looking at going down the carbon road as well, whether it's oil and gas, mining, um, you know, uh, other, there's other ones out there too, but those are the ones that are familiar. So agriculture's position to play in the short term but I think the benefit that we see with producers and Harry touched on this is if these practice changes work, it's going to work profitably for farmers and they're going to keep doing it. 
you know, we go back to no-till. It made sense economically. It made sense sustainable, sustainably. And it, it still happens today. So I think some of these management practices that were encouraging and working with farms to adapt again will be around for the long term if that mindset mindset shifts or that paradigm shifts to the way that we're thinking about agriculture and how we view carbon going down the road. So Derek, on this uh, this topic, uh, and uh, Harry just typed this thing out here, voluntary versus more of a mandated marketplace. I mean, uh, Trimble took you on, you're, you're with Trimble now, and God knows that's got to cost him like a million, million and a half dollars a year. So you're uh, making the big bucks there. And uh, so my, my question is, how does, how, how are, and I know you've been there a relatively short period of time, but how do you view, uh, you know, Alberta had a, a registered marketplace with a defined 104 large final emitters. Most people don't know this. And those large final emitters had a target to either pay into the fund or buy offsets. Everybody's talking about a voluntary market. Yahoo. Um, I don't know how you, you know, build on a completely voluntary market, but do you guys sniff out, do you smell something along the lines of a more red regulated market going forward, Derek? Well, that's tough to say. It's it's all government, of course, and and we've we've talked to the to the different governments in Canada and the United States, and and everybody's working on it. Whether it's state government, provincial government, federal governments, they're all working on it today. So there there will be something that is regulated in each state in each province in you know in in in, in time. We don't know if that's a year uh, down the road or two, but yeah, those regulated markets will be there. Um, you know regulated versus voluntary and I agree with Harry that that we need to move away from voluntary uh, and and into more of a supply chain inset right that's you know I've said that a couple of times you know and I think that's where the industry industry is going to evolve from voluntary into inset markets interesting any thought about that Harry yeah and when when we say volunteer so supply chain inset it, it, it would almost look like a value at VAT like they have in Europe so the what I was getting at with voluntary versus uh, let's say state or carbon tax is that de so someone buying carbon wants to pay the lowest price possible and then uh, bringing credits online right now is really easy so the demand curve shifts in the supply curve shifts out which essentially um, forces the price down continuously so. It, as um, as Derek says, a more regulated space is it's not just good for uh, buying and selling carbon. It's it's kind of necessary. Michael, you had a thought here. Yeah, I you know looking at regulated, I got into consulting thirteen years ago, and thirteen years ago we were looking at the province of Saskatchewan having a regulated market. I think that's one one thing that's different is voluntary can move quicker because it's internal with corporations where regulated you have elections every four years or two years and the people are changing. So to to move at a at a speed that is, you know, the industry wants, I think that's why the voluntary is really taking off right now. They can control internally what they want to see, what they want to happen without waiting for government to be on their side because we see we saw those delays in the past and we continue to see those delays today there has to be some sort of a give back the canadian farmer right now vis-a-vis -vis the american farmer is at a differential disadvantage you mentioned carbon tax harry we pay carbon tax in canada on the machinery that we bring to the farm we pay carbon tax on the fuel we pay carbon tax on the fertilizer we pay carbon tax on the seed and or on the on the chemical that we spray in the spraying operation we pay carbon tax right now still on the grain drying and then on the hauling of the grain to the elevator and then on top of that we pay goods and services tax so it is a punitive disadvantage to the canadian versus the american farmer right now and I think the only way to uh, see that uh, smoothened out is for us to get paid for doing some of the good work like the no tillage, like the nitrification inhibitors that farmers can use. I We have uh, six minutes to wrap up here. So I'm going to give you guys all uh, a minute or so to to have a closing thought. 
And uh, I think I'll start off with Derek on closing thoughts about what do you see? You made a big change here uh, to, to join Trimble um, in, in the recent months. And so, you know, why did you do it? And what are you seeing? Well, I, and like I said earlier on, I'm passionate about the food industry. And, and the, you know, that's part of the grain business for me and our, you know, the supplies that Canada has, so, you know, canola and wheat and barley and all the commodities that we grow and the beans and the corn in the United States. You know, you and I, Rob, I remember having this conversation with you about 12 years ago that, yep. you know, about food traceability and, yep. and the importance of that. And that was reason for a lot of the aggregative solutions that we were building back 12 years ago. It's no different today. We're still doing that traceability and trace. Carbon is one, but it's really, we were working towards the same sustainability 12 years ago and, 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 and continue to do that today. And so it's no, it's not a big change for me really in, in what I do day to day different company, but it's still about food sustainability, traceability, data collection. Uh, the, you know, carbon's a big, big part of that uh, and will continue to be a big part of that, but it's really about a safer food and, and making sure that our consumer packaged goods are safe and traceable. And, and I think that's what the, what the consumer is wanting. You know, we hear about uh, that a lot today. You know, you're, you've talked about it a lot in your books and different things about the consumer packaging and the demand that's coming today and we've got to meet the challenge. You know, uh, uh, Neil, uh, you mentioned uh, quickly in one of your statements about the blockchain while bouncing off of Derek, blockchain helps to guarantee the immutability of, of where things come from. Your thoughts as we close out this session on carbon and sustainability, and are they the same thing? Uh, I, I would say I agree with, with Derek, um, you know, they're one one of the same, one begets the other, um, sustainability being the overarching carbon being a piece of that. Uh, and really, you know, I, it's exciting to see what carbon asset is doing in terms of bringing some confidence uh, in in terms of measurement through to monetization and, and, and really providing a, a turnkey solution for the landowner and whatever that looks like for, for their operations. Uh, I would love to see the voluntary and regulatory markets come closer together until such time that regulatory, you know, surpasses. Um, lots of conversations that are needed in, in many different levels, uh, government all the way down to the farm gate, um, and those need to continue to be pushed. Uh, at the moment, I think, you know, the, the one thing I continue to leave with everyone that I talk to, uh, really understand from sequestration component, um, what, what information you are being provided and what that means in terms of creating value for those carbon credits. Um, and that is that is laser focused on what we do, but that's the, the thought that I, uh, I'll leave with. Okay, that's fine. And then uh, Graham Gilchrist uh, said, Rob, the third approach is avoidance, uh, permanence. So uh, permanence, you can avoid uh, using uh, greenhouse gas increasing uh, products. And a lot of the things we're doing with 4R, for example, does that. Permanence um, is a challenge, but you're addressing that, Harry. And I was really excited to have you on uh, the webinar and propagate on AgVisor Pro. Uh, why don't you just kind of talk to us a little bit about uh, why are you doing what you're doing and, 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 and maybe just a close off thought? Yeah, absolutely. We started Propagate with the idea that agricultural landscapes should be ecosystemically robust. And when you walk from a forest into a cornfield, uh, the latter is producing the food that we eat and the former is filtering our water and our air. Yeah. And there, there doesn't have to be a, um, a binary there and that you can have, have your cake and eat it too. And Carbon is a fantastic proxy for broader ecosystem services, such as biodiversity, flood control, uh, nutrient uptake. And if we can do that in a way that's profitable to farmers and doesn't interfere or uh, improves their existing operations, that, that's really the thesis that we've, we've been operating on for about seven years now. Okay. And Agroforestry, it's, it's a set of new practices, and those are going to be applicable to different farms in different ways. 
And we've just demystified all of that. So if anyone would like to reach out, we're at propagateag.com. Yep. And uh, of course, uh, the financing is available for this through Propagate. So it's very interesting. Michael, as you uh, listen to all this uh, final word to you, you said that you're uh, between the, the, the boots in the field and the farmer and what she is trying to hear from the marketplace and talking to the boardroom companies. Um, what, what did you take away from today? And, and uh, what's your closing thought? Well, I guess my closing thought is, you know, we need to continue to provide custom uh, carbon solutions for these companies because each company is going to have their own goals, agendas. You know, many of these companies are worldwide, so they're going to have different projects in different continents, right? So they're going to reach out to North America for a specific uh, spot in their portfolio that they need to be addressed on their emissions. So, you know, we need to continue to uh, keep that in mind. but. Another thing too is where where can you turn to in the industry to complement? Because I don't think there's one company that can do this all on their own. Um, so I think each company on here has their own strengths, has their own um, focus. And if we can continue to work together as an industry, you know, we've been very fortunate. We've been approached by many different companies, many different partners to implement custom carbon solutions for their goals. And, you know, we're looking at finding the right partners to measure, to bring in on different aspects. So, I, you know, Harry, you're, you're the professional on the, on the tree side, right? And Derek, you're the professional on the, on the tech side. And Neil, you got the measuring and verifying, um, you know, where does everyone fit? Realizing their strength and looking forward to moving this industry together. Because I think in the end, closing out, we all need to kind of work together to move it forward as this is a relatively new space and you know, there's a lot of education that needs to happen amongst all different levels. Perfect. Well, I want to thank all of you for being on the AgVisor Pro webinar. AgVisor Pro is downloadable on iOS and Android, and you can ask your questions anonymously. They're geotagged. And if the question deals with carbon, it'll invariably bump into one of these people here and you can reach them all on AgVisor Pro platform. That concludes another one of our webinars, and this is also a podcast, so we hope that you enjoyed the conversation. I want to say a big hats, uh, thank, uh, big hats off to uh, Taylor Venu, who uh, co coordinates all this for AgVisor Pro. Until next time, over and out, and sequester some carbon and make the sky cleaner.